So good evening. This is the real Benvenuto, Benvenuti. Uh, I'm Jane Tylus. I'm a professor of Italian studies and comparative literature at NYU, and it's a real privilege to be here this semester with our wonderful master students who were sitting uh, to my right, uh, as well as the faculty who were working with them here at La Pietra, who include Natalia Piombino, Ilaria Sporgi, and especially Bruce Edelstein, who has done so much for our Tuesday evening seminars. I want to thank him and Claudia for all the work they do to make tonight and other nights like this possible. I'm also very uh, happy that the chair of our Department of Italian Studies in New York, Professor Virginia Cox, is here with us tonight, flying in from New York for a conference in Rome, and very kindly uh, agreed to come here uh, before heading to, uh, to the Eternal City. So great to have you with us, Virginia. Uh, but on to our speaker. It's a real pleasure to welcome here to La Pietra to our graduate seminar, Susan Forscher Weiss, who is a professor of musicology at the Peabody Institute with a joint appointment in the Department of German and Romance Languages at the Johns Hopkins University. And, fortu and fortunately for us, and I imagine for her, uh, she is here in Florence this semester as the Robert Lehman Visiting Professor at Villa Itati. It's wonderful to see so many Itatiani here in the audience tonight. Uh, and it's also wonderful to see one of Professor Weiss's colleagues, uh, Richard Goldthwaite, uh, joining us uh, as well from, uh, from Hopkins. Um, Professor Weiss has written a wide-ranging number of essays in national and international journals, such as the Journal of the American Musicological Society, Early Music, and Renaissance Quarterly. And among her book publications are Bologna Q18, an introduction and facsimile edition, and Music Education in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance which she co-edited with Russell Murray and Cynthia Cyrus. She has received a number of awards. I won't go through them all. I'll just name a few from the ACLS, the NEH, from Harvard University, the Folger Shakespeare Library, and from the Johns Hopkins University for innovations in teaching and technology. She's currently the recipient of two grants, one from the NEH on digital prosopography. Did I say that right? Um, and from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, for a program in music cognition. She's thus an exemplary citizen for a form of interdisciplinary studies that obviously doesn't just pay lip service, right, to, walk, to working across disciplines, but that actually takes on the very hard work of learning about areas very different from the humanities, uh, in her case, neuroscience and the tough art of mastering 21st century technologies. Professor Weiss is currently working on two very different projects. Uh, one on the music and lyrics of the American songwriter Cole Porter, and I understand there was a fabulous Cole Porter concert a couple of weeks ago at a Itati lodging. Uh, and as we'll hear more about tonight on the subject, uh, another project on the subject of images, music, and memory in the early modern world. And, and just to close on a personal note, I, I have to say I can't imagine anyone more suited to studying memory. Uh, our now 24-year-old son auditioned at Peabody when he was applying to college, and Susan very kindly met with him when he was in Baltimore for his visit. Six years later, uh, she not only remembers that she met him, uh, but she remembers his name and even remembers to ask about him when we're in touch. So I'm very touched by, by that. He was very touched by um, Susan giving him the kind of time she did when he met her in Baltimore. And I know that I can say with confidence that you're in for an extraordinary treat this evening, as she will give a talk entitled, How Things Got Out of Hand, Images of Memory as a Mirror of Musical Learning in Early Modern Europe. Susan Weiss. Oh my, that was such a lovely talk. Um, many thanks to Jane, to Bruce, to Claudia uh, for inviting me here, helping me get this all set, um, to talk about my work very much in progress. Um, there's a little handout, Talk on Hands has to have a handout, um, but that's for you to consult later, and the students are sporting purple gloves Hold them up with inscriptions on the hands. Although I think Jane's hand that appeared in the Corriere della Sera last week is the oldest uh, and wins the prize for the very oldest hand. How many thousands of years ago? I think this was like 3,000 years ago. Here, well, I'm going to send that around. 5,000? This one. It's definitely older. I mean, I have found some pretty old, but not quite that old. Um, so, of course, there are, there are the issues of uh, animals, too, and what's happened here to the... There we go. Um, it's coming, I think. There, there we go. This, uh, this is actually... I, I didn't even realize it until today. It was the... Uh, what do you call it? The splash page on my computer. 
And I looked at it, and we have a colleague, I have a colleague at um, Itati, Mikhail, I don't think Mikhail is here, who's studying canons, and they're actually, um, they're actually, you see the mice? They're chasing the mice, as in three blind mice. So it is, it is a canon. Um, so, so singing cats, and then another colleague of mine at Itati, which is the wonder of the place, that you get to find out so many things uh, that you wouldn't already know. Um, the other colleague, is working on South American food and sent me um, an article about singing sloths who actually can sing the Guidonian hexachords upside down. Um, and so that um, added to all of the other coincidences, uh, such as being in on Via Bolognese, in the Sala Bolognese. Uh, at NYU, which is the place that my father uh, graduated from in 1927 and from its law school uh, that I attended um, for one year taking a course with Gustave Ries, a great musicologist. Um, and my sister-in-law is a graduate of the medical school. So I think things um, are coming full circle. And um, we will be talking about circles today, too. And about hearing, seeing, and touching. And you'll see, I think, that hearing is going to win out. So this story, without um, further uh, uh, talk, is about, um, it's, it's, it's coming full circle. And it began for me in Bologna in 1980 uh, in the Civico Museo Bibliografico Musicale with a musical manuscript known simply as Q18, as Jane mentioned, a collection of polyphonic compositions, most without text or composer attributions, compiled in about 1500. One of the scribes was a Bolognese musician, Giovanni Spataro, uh, which is right here, I've identified him. As the Maestro di Capella at the Church of San Petronio, they are a theorist, a composer, an avid correspondent. Um, and this um, the portrait uh, by Lorenzo Costa shows him singing with members of the Bentivoglio family and other professional musicians, um, so amateurs and professionals singing together. Now, nearly 35 years later, my current project has taken me back to Bologna to examine a treatise published there in 1482, which we'll see shortly, written by Spataro's teacher, Bartolomeo Ramos de Pariah. The one composition by Ramos that survives is a puzzle canon uh, contained within a circle on the frontispiece of a manuscript of music with numerous concordances with Bologna Q18, this one in Florence, right here in the Biblioteca Nazionale, Banco Rari 229, compiled in the 1480s for Beatrice of Aragon and her husband, Matthias Corvinus, the King of Hungary. Apart from the hand, the geometric shape of the circle is one of the more important memory devices for teaching the rudiments of music theory. So we have circles and we're going to have hands too. The manuscript uh, Bologna Q18, both copies of Ramos's book, and the entire collection in this venerable library um, was inherited from Padre Giovanni Mart Martini, Mozart's teacher, here in a portrait by Angelo Crescimbeni, next to Crespi's painting of his library, completed between 1720 and 30. It's one of the most prestigious collections of printed music in cunabula, um, letters, manuscripts, opera libretti, autographs, correspondences that Martini held with eminent scholars and musicians of the time. In 1816, the collections were donated to the Liceo Musicale in Bologna, established in 1804 at the former Augustinian convent in San Giacomo Maggiore. Um, where just a few years ago, Roberto Di Cecco and his ensemble Speculum recorded pieces from Q18. Uh, in 2004, for a variety of reasons, the library at the conservatory at Piazza Rossini was closed and relocated to its new home at Strada Maggiore in the Palazzo Sanguinetti and renamed Museo Internazionale at Biblioteca della Musica di, di Bologna. So that confuses all of the collocation numbers. Here is a hand, not one of the ones that the student's wearing. Um, in Bona, uh, Bonaventura da Brescia's manual for teaching the rules of chant, the young choristers, printed in 1497 and owned by Martini. I don't know if you can see his, his inscription right there. 
Uh, next to it is a 13th century manuscript, now in the Bibliotheca Ambrosiana in Milan, with a rather famous portrait, supposedly of the 11th century monk Guido, pointing to the inscribed musical hand, an image that never appeared in any of his writings. In 1996, and Amy has, has it right here to show you, I curated an exhibition of music at the Walters Art Museum in honor of the annual meeting of the American Musicological Society. Visitors bought out all the souvenir tea and nightshirts adorned with an image of the musical hand from one of Henry Walters' two late 15th century copies of Hugo von Reutlingen's Flores Musicus. The title of the exhibition, The Director's Idea, Not Mine, was Singing Along with Guido and Friends. Uh, right. Um, soon after, I became involved in Claire Richter Sherman's project on hands and memory. Um, and um, that produced a catalog, writing on hands, memory, and knowledge in early modern Europe, and exhibitions at Dickinson College and the Folger Shakespeare Library. In 2005, I published another essay on hands in the journal Music and Art, one that I believe some of the students have looked at with the title, Disque Manum Tuum, Si Vis Bene Discere, Learn Your Hand If You Want to Sing Well, Symbols of Learning Music in Early Modern Europe, followed by talks at various places, including Stanford, Northwestern, the University of Basel. My interest in hands um, has, uh, and in learning uh, resulted also in a chapter entitled Vandal Students or Scholars, Handwritten Clues in Renaissance Music Textbooks in the uh, book that Jane also mentioned that I co-edited. Um, and also more recently in a chapter in Heinrich Larion's books, The Intellectual World of 16th Century Musical Humanist, a volume edited by Ian Fenlon and Inga Mai Grote. These two publications focused on another Segreto del Rinascimento, the often overlooked manuscript annotations in the margins of printed books. The large kettle drums seen in various frescoes painted by Lippo Vanni in the 1360s are closer in construction to types found in India and Persia with laces and pointed sticks as opposed to the screws in, and rounded mallet seen in Northern Europe nearly 100 years later. Um, this recent article that I wrote on these percussion instruments also figures into my current research on the Silk Road. This past March, I gave a paper at the Renaissance Society meeting in New York, one on prosopography and then another in the session on music and pornography, very different, um, that also <laughs> relates <laughs> trust me, um, to my work on images, the Ars Memorativa, and the cross-fertilization of cultures. The association of music with sex, gluttony, prostitutes, Jews, Saracens, etc., was a common theme in medieval art and literature. But this is very special, and Bruce Halsinger, Anna Maria Busaberger, Mary Carruthers, Bonnie Blackburn, and others have cited him, Elias Salomonis, a 13th century French scholar based in Rome, who, in his Scientia Artis music, Musicae, wrote about books of organum that were actually being misused by the singers who would turn the contours of the beautiful pages into sexually charged musico-visual spectacles. He talks about embracing and kissing and coming together, and coppola is a term in organum, which I don't have to define. On the nature, <laughs> on the nature of, let's go back here, of the uh, semitone, E to F or Mi to Fa, Elias also stated, and you see it here on the right, uh, the nature of E is that it has a very masculine and rigid value and takes Mi and La and no other syllable and is always struck forcefully. F has a womanly agreement and the nature of the feminine sex and on it only oot and fa may be sung. And whenever the singer needs F, whether ascending or descending, it's necessary to subdue and soften it. These syllables belong to the hexachord, which consists of six notes, oot or do, re, mi, fa, so, la. We can sing it, ready? Oot, re, mi, fa, so, la. And you can all see over there, as they raise their hands, that there are three patterns, the hard hexachord that we just sang, presumably on G, then the next one, four notes later on C, 
and the next one on F, overlapping seven times, gamma ut at the tip here of the finger, and I think you can see it on Amy's shirt at best because it's very, very large. Um, and from the gamma ut, you go this way, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and then around, and the last, the 21st note doesn't fit, so it's above, but it's on the other side of the hand. And they are wearing, let's see if you remember what you have, Guido, Guido, Caperon, Caperon was on the poster for this session, Vaneo, back and front, and Adam, where's Adam? And then the most interesting is Ramos, which does not contain the hexachord we just sang, but a different set of syllables that we'll sing later. <laughs> we'll refer to each of these as we go along. The image of Guido pointing to the inscribed hand is also from Elias's manuscript. The monk most famously invented a method of teaching young choristers to sing by using, by note, by using a staff and a model song. Um, <laughs> An image of the inscribed hand, usually the left palm, but occasionally right and left, only later became a symbol of Guido's method, and it was sometimes attributed to others, such as Pythagoras, or Boethius, or Jesus. <laughs> um, and it was known, actually, that students were punished for not learning the method developed by Guido. They were beaten and sometimes even murdered. In the hand attributed to Pythagoras, if you see here a triangular extension uh, that threatens to gouge the wrist while the hammers may symbolize the pounding of nails into the flesh of Christ or maybe the story of the blacksmith and the origin of the intervals. On the right, you have the, um, right here, there you go, a German classroom with the teacher holding a birch uh, and you know what happens to the students who don't know their sulfa. Um, I don't have to go into that. All right, so the spiral pattern that I was just trying to show you is, is seen here in this hand, uh, the Hugo's, Hugo's hand that is drawn in a graphic. So here's the G, A, B, C, D, E. That's the G hard hexachord. Then the natural starts on C, so that becomes ut in the next one, but it's fa in the G. So we have ut, re, mi, fa, so, la again, and then on F, ut, re, mi, fa, so, la, and then on G we start again with the three hexachords overlapping. Got it? Everybody has that now? <laughs> there will be a test at the end. Um, okay. So this uh, spiral pattern seemed to be associated with the learning of plain chant through to the 19th century, while for a variety of reasons, every non-Catholic didactic manual eliminated the image or substituted the scale of the hexachords, while others kept the image but altered its inscriptions. In his essay, Looking Forward, commemorating the 50th anniversary of Villa Itati, Lino Pertile calls to mind an issue, a key issue about perseverance and courage of convictions. He cites such figures as the Bolognese humanist Lorenzo Valla and the Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus, who also spent time in Bologna, and their refusal to be satisfied with inherited assumptions, even in the face of rebuke and ostracism. Bartolomeo Ramos de Perea arrived in Bologna from Spain at some point in the 1470s, another maverick who participated in the Bologna area, Bolognese area of Disputatio, not specifically at the university, but in Bologna, refusing to be satisfied with inherited assumptions. The rebuke he received drove him away. It is time to take a fresh look at what might have led him to become a pariah, Ramos. This is the pun intended, Ramos de Perea became a pariah. In the process, we will see how his images act as a double mirror, one side reflecting changes in the musical culture of the late Quattrocento, the other offering a glimpse into the future of music theory. In his day, too, Guido was considered a revolutionary for trying to change a time-honored tradition, but he was fortunate in having a backing of, of a very important bishop by the name of Theodore. Guido's pedagogy forever changed the way music was taught. No longer was it necessary to pass on melodies orally. So we're talking about an oral to a written uh, transmission. He believed that his method of reading trumped the one that used the monochord. Recent scholarship 
by Stuart Lyons, a senior classicist at King's College Cambridge, has revealed that the melody in Guido's model song, Ut Quaint Loxis, a hymn to John the Baptist set to music by the 8th century historian Paulus Diaconus, is a contrafact. And I thank Catherine Bosey for getting me these books, because I didn't even know they existed. Um, and they're recent. In a manuscript in Montpellier, Lyons uh, located almost the identical music set to an ode by Horace. Here are the notes of the hexachord, and you can see them uh, circled in red, and we can listen to the model song. <laughs> is the ode to Phyllis. And several verses of, of that um, going um, through the same hexachords, um, the ut re mi fa so la, um, in, the, in Horace's ode to Phyllis. It should be said that in much of the improvised traditions in Arab and Hindu music, for example, model songs were used as points of mental reference. Images as, as aids to memory have long been subject to scholarly debate. A number of ancient sources, in particular the anonymous um, Rhetorica ad Herenium and the Institutio Oratorio, Oratorio by Quintilianus, also a Spaniard, writing in the first century, described methods for memorizing important information. Quintilian believed that a mastery of finger reckoning was the mark of an educated orator, yet neither he nor others were, be able, to, were able to explain the system and how it worked. Uh, there are some images, however, that show the movement of hands and these are two of them, one from Pietro Canuzzi's Regule, Rules for Counterpoint, and the other on the right from one of Gaforius's uh, three treatises showing him and his students using their hands in a chironomic fashion. Although images are there to help place objects in appropriate places, Quintilian placed more emphasis on the capacity to memorize. He speaks of Plato's warning in his Phaedrus that one must exercise memory by calling things to mind from within, not by means of external marks. And Blair writes, quote, a capacious and prompt memory was highly regarded as a sign not only of intellectual ability, but also of moral worth, unquote. One image intended to aid in achieving this was the hand, particularly the palm and the five fingers. When inscribed, it operates like a modern palm pilot, becoming a tool for short-term memory, which can increase to long-term memory uh, by the act of writing. The hand stood as a metaphor for the whole person, linking the physical and spiritual aspects of the body back to the universe, and is also said to be the site for creative, manual, and intellectual skills. So despite controversies, the hand became important in the East and the West at about the advent of writing. It only ceased to be important in the 19th century with the waning of thought regarding the body as God's highest creation in favor of a more mechanistic world. Accounts of Chinese with prodigious memories are actually beginning to be known in the West. Um, the multivalent process that includes poetic and verbal mnemonics such as rhymes and jingles alongside visual cues is just being uncovered. Uh, by my colleague at Johns Hopkins, Marta Hansen, in the Department of History of Science. Um, and she says the Chinese also employ a third type of hand mnemonic that is corporeal and kinesthetic. And uh, this is, these are Asian um, hands with these little um, balls that you use because you have to add that kinesthetic quality to hearing and, and seeing. 
Um, and so these images of Chinese hands date to the 10th or 11th century and are still in use today. The verbal cues in the hand read in a spiral or clockwise or a, a spiral pattern. And the circle diagrams next to them accompany uh, them with further information. Images in ancient synagogues, and I just found these, in Syria depict hands, trees, and circles. In these examples are the hand of God. I think you can see it right there. It's very, very light. Um, and the tree of life as a symbol of the Torah from a third century mural above the temple shrine and an array of all kinds of images including the zodiac and a musician uh, from a sixth century mosaic on the floor of a synagogue in Bet, Bet Alpha in Syria. The 13th century Mallorcan logician Raymond Lull based his Ars Magna on Aristotelian categories and combined those with his knowledge of Arabic and Jewish traditions to develop a memory system uh, that included shapes of circles, squares, triangles, ladders, and trees. In the East, diagrams with concentric circles are found in astronomic treatises, uh, such as this one uh, by the mathematician, Islamic astronomer, and mathematician Ibn al-Shatir, who developed a model based on earlier work by the Persian Nasser al-Din Tuzi. His work was, and that all of that surrounding his work, was said to have influenced Copernicus. In the West, images as memory theaters, and the students know about some of these, such as hands, circles, trees, and buildings were associated with learning in many disciplines, such as architecture here in this um, Vitruvius de Architectura, Computus in uh, Bede's De Temporum Rationem, uh, in grammar manuals for learning the declensions and the conjugations, calendrical calculations, you all know 30 days, half September. Curiously, the alternation of white and black notes on the keyboard beginning with F for January is intended to accomplish the same thing. Here is another example from a treatise on canon law and um, one a chirosol to Reum, uh, by Montbert for remembering the Psalms, or for good luck in um, here the Mano Poderosa, or the various Hebrew, here's a Hebrew hand from a musical, uh, a translation of a music treatise, or and the Arabic hand here, uh, or ones used in Chinese uh, for predicting lucky days. Add to these hands for sign language and numerous other subjects. Images related to music are found as early as the first textbook of music, the ninth century, Musica and Curiatis, on the left. Apart from teaching how to sing chant and organum, the book privileges an understanding of the centrality of music, grammar, and rhetoric in Carolingian education, of Boethius, the prime expositor of Greek harmonic traditions, and of the influence of musical concepts from Byzantium. On the right, these 11th century diagrams were probably intended for children who were learning their intervals, their Pythagorean intervals. There are also hands uh, in the 11th and 12th century musical manuscripts for remembering tunes and psalm tones before the invention of the staff, when there, was no, there were no st staff lines or just one, and then two became uh, the norm. Typically, most hands are inscribed on the left, but as you see, whoops, you did see that. Uh, this one on the right uh, from the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris is right and left. All right. Uh, by the 15th century, the hand became paired with the scale or ladder um, of the hexachords or with an instrument known as the monochord. In this 15th century folio, now in the Library of Congress, a hand is drawn on one side and on the other, Lady Musica, uh, with a monochord in the form of Cerberus on her lap. The woodcut from a copy of one of Gaforius's other treatises illustrates the power of music as a basis for the endeavors of man represented by the muses up here with Apollo and uh, for the structure of the universe. Without going into the iconographic details, take note of Cerberus, here he is again, the three-headed dog transformed into a monochord uh, separating the Greek pitches from the medieval modes or patterns of pitches. The monochord's origins were attributed to Pythagoras. Let's go back here for a minute and look at this particular, another of the images from uh, Gaforius's treatises. 
And the uh, story is that he was passing the blacksmith shop and he heard the hammers and then he went and, and practiced on bells and water glasses and pipes with his friend Philolaus and then invented this instrument called the monochord, but this is not a monochord, this is really uh, more of a dulcimer. Um, here in Johannes Gallicus's uh, treatise, he included the hand in one part, two versions of it, uh, simple and more complex, and later a monochord. Um, an even closer resemblance to that instrument is in Keck's treatise, also written around the same time. Um, and on the right is probably one of the more imaginative representations of the monochord, uh, as it appears in Robert Flood's early 17th century treatise, Utrius Quick Cosme Maioris, where it represents the harmony of the spheres. The spiral navigations around the 21 places on the fingers seemed practical enough for singers learning plain chant, but became unwieldy as musical ranges expanded. Some hands appear to have spiral inscriptions, but on closer look, there are nuanced differences. These hands actually have scalar or ladder patterns. And um, you can see it's G, A, B, C, D, E, F. G-A-B-C instead of the spiral. And what's interesting is we talked about C, G to C, which is a fourth, and C to F, which is a fourth. And fourths were important in the Middle Ages, but lo and behold, what do we have here? C to G, G to D, we have fifths. And the fifths are going to be extremely important. And if I'm getting into too much detail in theory, this is about theory. Um, but they were extremely um, uh, important in the Renaissance as the triad. Um, it took over. So here's one of those hands. This is uh, in the Portuguese theorist Vincente Lusitano's treatise, Introduzione Felicissima, printed in Rome in 1553 and again in Venice in 1561. The Guidonian hand contains the latter schema and I have it marked with the um, red arrows showing you the direction of those, of those fifths. Uh, Lusitano was a Protestant convert and engaged in his own money wager dispute in Rome with another theorist by the name of Niccolo Vicentino. Lusitano, like Ramos, sought to modify the Guidonian hexachord. The hand in a revision, and here is the identical hand um, to the one we just saw, this is a revision of a very popular student manual, Scala di Musica, by Orazio Scaletta. In the 1642 edition, it's the typical spiral pattern. There's the C, D, E, F. And here, we think the printer made a mistake and included, because it was the same printer who printed Lusitano's treatise, included the Lusitano hand by mistake. So not that Scaletta was forward thinking. He wasn't. So now we have the Vaneo, and this is really a very beautiful hand. So who, who's wearing Vaneo? Just, just hold that up, and I, I'm going to explain it. In an effort to expand the range, he included this elaborate hand, palm and exterior, in his 1533 treatise. The lowest note on the palm, um, gamut, becomes G, sol, re, ut. So this note here becomes G, so you have to turn it around, right? And um, you're going to go down this way all the way to gamut there, okay? And then the highest note on the palm, the E, la, goes in this direction spirally at the top, and so you get the highest note, fourth space on the modern treble clef, and this very, very low note. Who would be singing or playing so high or low a register is uncertain, but that is his hand. Um, Heinrich Larion, who I've been studying, in his early treatises never uh, used the hand. Um, he was very uh, important in the 16th century in music theory for adding four new modes to the existing eight, and thus the title of his famous treatise of 1547, the Dodecacordon, or 12 strings, um, was, was a very critical work. Um, he broke with Luther, though, and other reformers and became a defender of Guidonian pedagogy. So in 1557, he abridged his Dodecacordon, revised it, uh, in the Musica Practica Epitome and wrote it in Latin for use at his school in Basel and in German uh, for a convent in that city. In these books, traditional hands are present for practical and theological reasons. In my chapter in Sherman's catalog, I included the hand of Adam. Someone has Adam over there. There it is. 
it was getting hot, so she probably took it off. It's very hot wearing those rubber gloves. They're my husband's surgical gloves. Um, <laughs> not recognizing the subtle difference in the pattern on the hexachords. Adam, a teacher at St. Anna's School in Augsburg, had to cater to Catholics and Protestants because they shared the space in that one church. So the latter pattern was deliberate, was deliberate in this case, and you can see it's latter here, just as the other ones. And he included the scale of the hexachords for the Protestants, too, so a little Catholic and a little Protestant. Uh, this one I think Jane looked at when she was visiting me. It's Adriano Banchieri, 1622 Cantorino, and he created a system of Arabic, 14 Arabic numerals with a rule accompanying each one of them um, inscribed on the fingers, leaving the thumb free to point. In areas of uh, Europe where the Catholic Church was strong, musical hands continued to appear in treatises through to the 18th century. The hand even persisted into places in North America. Here are two examples for learning the Psalms, the one on the left in Philadelphia, the one on the right in Nova Scotia. Instrumental tutors included images of the hand configured for specific instruments, um, especially the popular lutes and keyboards. Um, a practical approach to learning both vocal and musical instrumental music is in this broadside printed in Venice in 1540 and on display in the Museo in Bologna. Um, it has the lute with inscriptions and music in tablature down here um, and mensural notation as well uh, along with text and all you need to know in order to sing and play the short composition given here. This is a, an encyclopedic image. The hand in Hans Judekind's lute and viol tutor printed in Vienna in 1515 is adapted to the needs of the lutenist, while Juan Bermudo's 1549 treatise describes a keyboard with four octaves, um, and um, the four octave range includes an image of this finger showing the octave beginning on C and going around counterclockwise to be natural. For some, the image of the hand carried negative connotations. There are those who believe that the absence of it meant a rejection of Guido's system of solmization. Perhaps that's too simple. One theory persists that the hand and its theological connotations represented Catholic practice and symbolism. Others have suggested the use of instruments in Protestant churches in Northern Europe and the British Isles eliminated the need for memory aids for singers, because they had the instruments. Additionally, a shift from the Aristotelian reliance on memory took place in the 16th century in German-speaking lands. Cochleus, on the left is from his treatise, was Glarion's teacher at the University of Cologne. And he included images of the hand in his early treatises, published around 1505, but in his textbook, the Tetracorda Musicus, first published in Nuremberg in 1511 for the St. Lawrence School, he substituted a graph of the hexachords. On the right is an image from Le Droit Chemin de Musique of Louis Bourgeois, an outspoken critic of the hand. Claudio Sebastiani includes the fairly common woodcut of the claves on the right, uh, but is one of the few to include trees. Um, and Ambrosius Vilthingsleder, this is one of my favorites, uh, the Eritomata of 1585, and we have this at Hopkins, contains graphs and volvels the Volvel, all of these wonderful role tools for figuring out the hexachords and other rudiments of music theory. Musicologist Jan Herlinger asked if my project would entail looking at non-Italians working in Italy. Um, my answer was yes. Um, in his book, Renaissance is the one or the many, anthropologist Jack Goody described a Judeo-Arab synthesis, both economic and socio-cultural, beginning in the 11th century when the cultural center of gravity of Judaism had moved westward from the Near East to Spain. When politics and religion drove musicians from Spain, Greece, and the Middle East in the 15th century, Italy became a melting pot for, the cultural, exchange, for cultural exchange. We've already documented, musicologists that is, the numerous contributions from Franco-Flemish musicians, but Greek emigres to the West found jobs there too, and many of them as musicians. The English also headed south, some of them schooled in Greek and Arabic. Here are some examples of two, of two non-Italian theorists struggling with Guido's limited pitches. 
a 12th century English theorist by the name of Thynred of Dover wrote about chromatic elements in plain song in his treatise Le De Legitimus, <laughs> this is hard to say, Le Legitimus Ordinibus Pentacordum et Tetracordum that survives in a single copy in the Bodleian Library. Writing at a time before Guido became the norm, Thynred, aware of Guido's methods, strove to remedy its deficiencies, not the least of which was the need for extra diatonic tones. He resorted to the use of numerous tables and these circles um, as it aids to learning. John Snyder, my colleague who's worked on Thynred, maintains that the spiroid basis of these diagrams is unique in medieval theory. Thynred had the courage to question prevailing theories, but his work never gained traction. In the early 15th century, on the right, um, Fernand Estevan, in what may be the first music treatise written in Spanish, describes a note below gamma, one that he calls a retropolis, um, and also remarked on the use in practice of so-called forbidden hexachords, those outside the three hard, natural, and soft articulated by Guido. Not all were looking to bash Guido. One who adhered to Guidonian practice was one of the most famous and respected theorists, teachers, and composers, the northerner Johannes Tinctoris, who came to Naples in the 15th century to work for the Aragonese court. There he tutored Beatrice, assisted by a Spanish composer by the name of Bernard Icart. Clemente Terni, the author of the Spanish translation of Ramos's treatise, believes that Ramos also came to Naples after first leaving Spain, but some think he also came to Arezzo. Not only is little known about Ramos' early years in Baeza, in the province of Jaén, confusion reigns regarding his life, his death, his whereabouts. Luanne Fossey, in her dissertation, a wonderful dissertation on the treatise, proposes a date of 1440 for his birth, but has him in an important position at the University of Salamanca in 1452, which would be remarkable if true, the Doogie Hauser of music. He attended the University of Salamanca, where he claims to have studied with Johannes de Monte, lectured in music, possibly even held the position as chair, and engaged in arguments with theorists at the university, including Pedro de Osma, a very uh, trusted and, and uh, respected theorist, and Tristan de Silva. He is said to have written a theory text in Spanish, a mass, a motet, and some other compositions, but none of these has survived. A letter from Spataro to Pietro Aran in 1532, written 10 years after Ramos' probable date of death, reported that Ramos had hoped to occupy the chair in music at the University of Bologna, which had been established in 1450, but was offended by the rejection of various faculties there, took all his printed copies of the one treatise and left for Rome. We have names of some of Ramos' Bolognese students, but other than Spataro, nothing is known about any of them. From Spataro, also, we learn that Ramos came to Florence to look at choral books at the Church of Santissima Annunziata. The presence of the canon in Banco Rari 229, as well as a reference to Ramos as ipsi quoque Florentini by the English theorist John Hothby, are further evidence that Ramos may have spent time in this city. After arriving in Rome, Spataro <laughs> reported that Ramos was upheld as maestro degli maestri, despite adopting, quote, a lascivious manner of living that led to his illness and death, unquote. Spataro sought to defend his poor teacher and argued with famous Italian contemporaries such as Nicolas Borzius and Franchino Gaforio in both published treatises and in his correspondence. Ramos' only surviving book, Musica Practica, was published in Bologna in 1482, where there are two extant copies. One is smothered in annotations by Spataro and Gaforius and others. In his attack on and calling him Monacus Fortasse Melior Quam Musicus, a better monk than a musician, and seeking to dismantle his hexachords as incorrect and far too complicated for practical use, we know that Ramos had a copy of Guido's Micrologus at his disposal. Bertius, one of his most ardent critics, stated in his Musicae Opusculum that he lent his copy of a Guidonian manuscript to Ramos in Bologna. His new scale had tuned fifths and thirds, believing it sounded better for contemporary music than the scale of Boethius or Pythagoras, or Jesus, um, that favored fourths over thirds. Ramos included a drawing uh, common in copies of 
Boethius's treatise on music. And you can see this beautiful copy of Boethius's uh, hand, lavishly hand-copied uh, 12th century De Musica with contemporary musical instruments even in the center of some of these diagrams. And again, the monochord and, and Cerberus, so some of the same uh, themes, same um, um, images persist. Um, what Ramos made the case against uh, was that the monochord should not be divided into equal numbers. He said that was okay for theoreticians, but not for singers. He dismissed the resulting imperfections of his scale as too small to worry about. In his treatise, Ramos included drawings of two hands, one with the Guidonian inscriptions, this one here, and another of his own design with new syllables. And the syllables are, salitor per voce sistas, an octave, right? And then he goes to the second octave going this way, salitor per voce sistas, and then the third octave, so three octaves. Uh, with a completely different set of, where's the Ramos hand? Hold it up, there it is. Uh, in the course of the a treatise, Ramos mentions an English writer working in Aragonese, Sicily by the name of Rogerius Caperon. You can see it here, he mentions him twice. Although he is critical of him, as he is of everyone, he shows him some sympathy for referring to his writing during heretical times, die heretico. About this theorist, we also know precious little, despite an essay by James Haar and recent dissertation by Gregorio Bevilacqua of Caperon's Commentum, now in the Bibliotheca Rioniti in Catania, Sicily. Caperon's hand, hold it up, it was also on the poster, and you can see it right here uh, on the right, is very unusual in that it includes Greek names for the syllables beyond the gamut. The lower one is the kuruf, which means the note below gamma, may, uh, gamma, may be equivalent to Estevan's retropolis, and krisis for a note above ila. What is particularly unusual are the images in the palm, all these circles. And the circles have to do with the Pythagorean uh, intervals and with, with rhythmic notation. And then this tree which is, is, is very important and found in other manuscripts as well. And I found uh, the tree in this uh, example from uh, a 14th century treatise by um, De Anya, the Liber de Musica, and then again in the 15th century in a circle. These are rhythmic uh, notations that are, that are very important here as part of the whole new learning of mensural music. Um, Caperon's treatise quotes almost verbatim from another Englishman, Robert Kilwardby, who may have been familiar with Arabic treatises. The writing of the Persian scientist Al-Farabi was known in part through the work of a 12th century converted Jewish philosopher and later Archdeacon of Segovia, Dominicos Gundasalinus, who was a member of the Toledo School of, Tran of Translators. Joseph ben Judah ibn Aknin made a translation of Al-Farabi's Kitab al-Musika, the great book of music in the 13th century. So whether Al-Farabi's work on music was known in a Latin translation is debatable, but many scholars were able to read Arabic and Hebrew. Ramos also wrote about the type of instruments he heard in Spain. He said, I heard these polychords with many, many more notes than are like anything here in Bologna. Much wider ranges, smaller intervals, smaller than the accepted Pythagorean semitone. One of these uh, polychords may have been similar to a shahrud, an instrument described in Al-Farabi's Kitab al-Musica, and this is actually from, from uh, the Kitab. Christopher Page has argued for the Arabic origins of instruments depicted in the Berkeley Array, the same 14th century set of manuscripts that contains treatises on forbidden hexachords and the tree with the rhythmic material that I just showed you. And recall the laces on the drums seen earlier, which are also connected to uh, the East, to Persia. Um, so these are some of the instruments in the Berkeley Array. The illuminations in the 13th century manuscript of Alfonso El Sabio the Cantigas de Santa Maria, and one of four surviving copies is here in Florence, lend further support to the idea that instruments, as well as performers, came from North America, North Africa, not North America, and the Middle East. 
On the right, actually, is an example of a modern-day shahrud from an exhibition that was held here on music from Azerbaijan. Speaking of the Berkeley Array, it also contains a canon in the shape of a circle attributed to a French composer connected to that manuscript. This may be the earliest example of a, um, a circle a canon. This is in the House of, of Daedalus. But there's another one in the 14th century, and this one is um, in a manuscript in Chantilly, and it's called Tout par compas, about the invention of the new compass. Ramos puzzle canon in Florence 229, and this is very beautifully illuminated uh, work. The illuminators were the de Montes um, of Florence 229. Contains the inscription, Mundus et musica et totus consentus. Four winds blow at the circle, while below it, cherubs hold up a panel with a quotation from Horace, again, from the third satire, Omnibus hoc vitium, all singers have their fault. If asked to sing among their friends, they are never so inclined. If unasked, they never leave off. And it reflects the character of the music because it's very hard uh, to, to find out where to start and also because it's a puzzle. It's very difficult to stop once it's begun because it's perpetual. And we can just hear a tiny bit of it performed by my students. Just a little bit. The second voice coming in. Too bad that's the only thing we have of, of, uh, of Ramos. Um, so not only does the circle represent the world and the newly invented compass, it symbolizes perfect menstrual time representing a perfect number. And I don't know if you also heard in there that uh, it was following a pattern of circle of fifths. Um, while the Spaniard Guillermo de Podio adhered to Guidonian practice, not even mentioning Ramos in his treatise of 1495, and they had to know one another, uh, a contemporary annotator of the Bologna copy added these concentric circles uh, in the passage where he's talking about the changes to, to music. And three decades later, another complex puzzle with puzzle canon with sequential modulations encased in a circle adorned with a Tudor rose, you know who that was for, was composed as a gift for Henry VIII. Um, and it took another few years before Adrian Villart's canon, also based on poetry by Horace, a drinking song, Quid Non Ibrietas, explored all chromatic notes with daring modulations. There is an earlier piece in Q18, not a canon, but a chromatically adventurous work with title only, Ne Op Ptolemus, that explores, explores a complete circle of fifths. And Ptolemy was uh, also part of the debate, um, uh, the Pythagoreans versus the Ptolemaeans who believed hearing was more important than this precise scientific uh, uh, partition of the monochord. And one has to ask if Spataro was not trying out some of his teacher's principles. Eventually, the circle of fifths became an accepted mnemonic aid, particularly for the study of instrumental music. It is now believed that the circle of fifths first appeared in the second half of the 17th century, not in a German treatise by Heineken, as had been thought, but in a Russian treatise by Nikolai Doletsky that included the circle and the hand, satisfying the needs of singers and instrumentalists alike. <laughs> That Spain is critical to our story is proven by a circle of fifths and hand in a Spanish guitar manual by Juan Carlos Amat, written in 1596 and published in two editions, the first in 1626. Both of these predate the German and Russian exemplars of circle of fifths. In Amat's treatise, the first seven chapters describe the stringing, tuning, and fretting of the guitar and how to play the 12 major and minor chords. For ease of remembering, he arranges the information in this circular table that contains all 12 major keys on the top half, N, and the bottom half, all 12 minor keys. For each chord, there are five spaces representing the five courses of the guitar, beginning with the first course nearest the center. Within each space are numbers representing the frets and letters um, to represent the fingers of the hand. 
To make it even clearer, Amat includes a diagram of the hand marked with the letters corresponding to the fingers. It's possible that a model for his circle was that of his countryman, Domingo Duran's Lux Bella, 1492, on the left. In summary, images functioned in a number of different ways, first assisting short-term visual memory. Hands could be visual and kinesthetic aids. They assisted those who were less literate and served the beginner in many didactic books. Factors impacted by the confessional divide, changes in musical composition, and the growing interest in musical instruments led theorists to alter or substitute the hand and its Guidonian solmization syllables with graphs of the hexachord. Raphael St. Cecilia symbolizes a reverence for vocal music and singing, while on the right, Raimondi, the cartoon reveals a shift towards instrumental music. You can see here the angels are singing. She's abandoned the broken instruments, and here the instruments are intact, and the angels are playing instruments. There's this paradigm shift towards the importance of instrumental music. So Ramos, in the only surviving treatise printed in Bologna, was arguably the first theorist to break with tradition by using a completely new set of inscriptions to the hand to frame his radical theories that replaced the outmoded hexachord with the octave. Recently discovered information about the printer of the treatise furthers our understanding of the somewhat extreme reaction to it. His lone surviving composition, The Circle Canon, demonstrates his conviction that tonality is on the horizon. Circles provide memory maps for relating newer concepts, such as rhythm and relationships between keys. They also aided in oral memory. Ramos read widely. His theories were informed by many diverse elements. That Spanish musical theory and practice needs more attention goes without saying. Just recently, my colleague Margaret Bent has put the remaining pieces of the puzzle together regarding the identity of the important music theorist Jacques de Liège, author of the 14th century treatise Speculum Musicae. He is most certainly Jacobus de Montibus, better known as the Spaniard Jacobus de España. The story does not end here, as there is further biographical, archival, and philological work to be done. More needs to be known about the life of Ramos before, during, and after Bologna, not the least of which is the impact of his having grown up amidst mu music soaked in multicultural traditions. With his new hand to blame for how things got out of hand, I'm not so sure. He certainly had precursors, but none quite so aggressive. At least he recognized the value of the image of the hand as an important mnemonic aid. After all, According to Tinctoris, possibly paraphrasing warning in the palm of many of those images, there was no worse slander for a musician than, quote, these words, that one is said not to know his hand, unquote. Thank you. I apologize for going on so long. <laughs> I have an extra glove here from the supermarket if anybody needs. Um, it would be great because we can hand you. Uh, Manus, mani, manicure, manifest, manicure. <laughs> oh, no, really, it will. It will. Please ask questions. Thank you, Susan. Um, this is like a kind of tangential question, I think, but. Do we know how the Ramos, the manuscript for Matthias Corvinus ended up at the, why is it in the Banco Rari? I mean, how did it get back to Florence, having been obviously illuminated here by the Del Monte at some point? It was, it was illuminated here, uh, and the collection was actually um, Heinrich Isaac very important composer, and Johannes Martini were probably responsible because the first set of pieces are alternations between pieces by Isaac and Martini. Isaac was definitely here in Florence, very involved with the Medici. Um, there's a lot of confusion now about Isaac and Isaac the Greek organist, um, but they, they were all here in Florence. And um, why, uh, Matthias died in 1490, so it had to have been before, before that. Um, that it was put together. But there are many, many pieces similar between that and Q18 and, this, and, and a circle of other manuscripts in the same orbit. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah, it's just, um, yeah, I think so. <laughs>
It was never, it was never, I, I think. It never made it to. Hungary, no, yeah. okay. no, no, all right. All right. no. Yeah, no, because, because Beatrice, of course, had connections here, Beatrice sure. of Aragon, and you know, she was even tutored by Tinctoris, uh, and this Spanish uh, theorist who was also a colleague of Ramos in Naples. Okay. The cities were closer than you. <laughs> yeah. Angela. As I understand, painting on the hand was um, something, for, something for students when they had to learn how to sing music. That's right. But when were, or which were the circumstances? Um, there are, for example, um, manuscript illustrations uh, which with teaching music, like um, with a professor and a cathedra and the students uh, sitting around, or was it rather when they were singing in a church or when they were exercising elsewhere? What was the concrete circumstance that students yeah. would paint this hand? I mean, we have to reconstruct, but for the most part, these were didactic manuals that uh, symbolized what might have taken place in a lesson um, where the teacher would point to the hand. Um, I actually, in the Stanford conference, was involved in singing using our hands. We sang polyphony. Um, it's very difficult, but you can do it. And I have a colleague who spent a whole semester using the hand to try to teach her students to sing. It, it, it truly is complicated. But, um, but, but maybe for, for the young choristers who were singing plain chant, which has a narrow range, it was useful, um, especially combined with the model song. Um, so I have two quick questions. Well, they may not be that quick, but but why I'm just I'm intrigued with the development of the keyboard, which obviously involves the placement of the fingers of the hand. On I, you know, I'm just wondering, is this a linear, material way of? Uh, I don't even know how to quite ask this. Just realizing what already is known about the power of the hand in music. So that's question number one. And, and question number two is just to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on this confessional divide. I'm, mm. I'm just really mm -hmm. intrigued with. Mm. What and why, you know, regarding the differences between, you know, Catholic uses of the hand, and then, you know, your suggestion re really um, quite provocative that, you know, the, after the Reformation, this, the hand is dropped for reasons that I would love to hear. You yeah, say more about. well, start with that question and then go back, um, I guess, to the monochord or the keyboard, or uh, exchequer, sometimes it was called. Um, the confessional divide, I think, is clear when you see images of the hand as the right hand of God pointing to the left hand. The symbolism of, of the hand in Catholic in theology is really quite strong in this period. And after, even before um, 1517, you see them being dropped. These hands are being dropped because of the, uh, con I think it's, it's partly the divide, but it's also part um, of the reluctance to, to make the association with Guido as Guido is being challenged. Guido is being challenged in the 15th century, and so by the 16th century, when printed manuals started, you know, in 1501 or so, to be produced, particularly in German-speaking lands where there were um, many, many Protestants, they just decided, let's drop it. In Ornithoparchus's treatise, he said, this is really too complicated. He includes no image, uh, either of the graphs or of the hand. He said, the Guidonian system is just way too, too complicated. Um, he doesn't get chastised. You know, it's very interesting. Um, my colleague Stefano Mangozzi has written a book on the Renaissance reform of, of Guidonian theory, and uh, he stops at around uh, 1500. Um, but he does, in one of his chapters, talk about Gaforius trying to stay in good, in, in, you know, in, in the uh, good graces of the Sforzas. And in order to do that, he had to pander a little bit. So he kept some of this Guidonian, because it was heretical to, to take a Catholic tradition that was taught in all of the you know, Catholic schools and say, no, this doesn't work anymore. So the retention, I think, is there to say, well, we still believe in it, but, but we're playing around with it to try to make it work. And then in terms of the, of the exchequer of the keyboard, you can see the you can follow the trajectory from the monochord into an instrument called the trumscheid or the tromba marina into keyboards. And then, you know, when you see the monochord morphing into the keyboard, you can almost understand how um, 
the intonation systems were developed. And Ramos, I didn't mention this, was, is responsible for perhaps being the first person to de develop uh, the idea of just intonation. So they're, they're really beginning to think in terms of tuning and temperament. Mm. Yeah. There was another question. Is it, so, uh, so far as the Protestant examples go, um, is it the image of the hand as a mnemonic that disappears, or is it the image full stop as mnemonic that ends up disappearing? Um, just because, you know, there would obviously be a whole lot going on there as far as the rejection of the image as mnemonic, regardless of, in that sense, what it's an image of. Sometimes the images, for example, on the right here, I think, uh, not this one isn't quite, so I took, I took one out that really looks a little bit like a hand. The claves, these are the scales, it's ut re mi fa so la. And instead of doing a hand, they're doing them in these, in these pipes, these organ pipes. Um, I, I think the absence of it, or the changing it, certainly these, this, this one on the right, he, he was extremely opposed to to uh, the hand, you, you don't see any resemblance here to it. Um, but he felt it was important to show the division of the scale, um, and so he, uh, he, kept it, he kept this in, in there. But there's another thing you should know, that most of these are didactic treatises. And if you look at the treatises by the scholars, there are few images. Very few images. I mean, there are the Boethian circles and so forth, but, but not images that would be used in practical teaching. So we're talking about theoretical and practical. Um, it, it's, it's many different binaries here. There's old and new, theoretical, practical, Catholic, Protestant. I mean, they're filled with all of these um, confusing uh, combinations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Is this on? Okay. Uh, I, my question is more general. Um, I was more familiar with the uses of hands as mnemonic devices for, say, preachers uh, and in other kinds of manuals. And I was wondering, this seems so much more sophisticated and much more complex than the uses that I was familiar with. And I was wondering whether that is because this tradition is older and more developed and those other uses of the hands as mnemonic devices derive from this use in uh, music or um, whether these are things that develop simultaneously? The uh, calendrical hands, most of the hands um, that you're, you're talking about probably precede the musical hand. The musical hand really didn't start in the you know, sense of the Guidonian hexachords until after Guido's treatises in the 11th century. The first hands really begin to appear around the 12th century. And I didn't include all the documents of the people who morph Guido's theory into something that should be applied to the hand. He never used the image in his treatise. When he wrote about it, it was about the method, it was about the staff, it was about the model song, but not the image. The image became applied to it later. I think the earliest, some of the earliest ones in the West were the calendrical hands. Um, but then you have the written <coughs> inscribed hand versus the hand that's used chironomically. And even today, with the Kodai method, you know, it's it's the do, re, mi, fa, so, la. It's, it's both um, kinesthetic and corporal, and you know, it's, it's all of these things together. And shape note singers um, as well use the hand chironomically. And, and are, what they're doing is they're matching the various uh, movements in the hand to the shapes of the notes, whether they be diamonds or squares or so forth. Um, and so you do find various things continuing uh, but I, as far as the theological hands and what was on them, I, I only know of the Chirosalterium and some of the other ones, the Gospels, you know, where you have all the different images of the Gospels on both hands. Those, those are probably earlier contemporaneous. Yeah. This is probably a very stupid question, but I can, I can understand how it works in terms of teaching, how it works in terms of theoretical things. How does it help you retain your musical memory for a long period of time? Hmm. My students would say no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think 
I, just from my own experience, seeing, hearing, and writing, when combined, are, I think they're, they're foolproof in terms of memory. But you need, I think you need all of them. On the other hand, think of Helen Keller, you know, who didn't mm -hmm. have those faculties and, and, you know, obviously remembered quite a bit. So I, I, I'm not sure that for everybody it works that way. Mm -hmm. But by and large, for young beginner, for the beginner, for, for the youth and for an adult beginner, I think this is a, a very good way of remembering. Um, hmm. I haven't done, my cognition experiments have not moved into that realm, but maybe I should. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. The writing part, I, I don't know, it's just a question. When, when did writing just fall out of that I don't know if the writing uh, fell out, but when you bring up this whole concept of, of did reading music um, disable the memory? Um, I think that many people say that the advent of musical notation uh, did limit uh, memory um, because people who sight read, um, I think Stefano was here, uh, have to have their music. Whereas uh, some of the studies we've done, we did fMRI studies with, in, with jazz musicians who go into this um, you know, CT scanner with a little piano that was invented by my colleague Charles Lim that doesn't have metal on it, so you can actually play. And the jazz musicians were playing um, anything they wanted, and the musicians who had to read music were playing actual notes. Different parts of the cortex light up in these two cases. And so there are, there are differences. And if you can play by ear, al mente, um, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different situation. So I, again, I think when your question ties in with this, um, young students, when they're learning, need to have some kind of basis. They have to have the technical um, materials. And, and so when I looked at that hand that Martini signed, and I thought, oh, Mozart maybe held this book in his hand, I thought, Mozart didn't need to learn this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great place to end. Susan, thank you so much. Thank you for being such good listeners. <laughs> <laughs>